Welcome to this session of the 25th Annual Texas Book Festival. My name is Sergio Troncoso, and I'm president of the Texas Institute of Letters. And today I'll be talking with uh, Ruben de Goyado, Lupe Mendez, and uh, Naomi Shehab Nye on our panel, Texas Institute of Letters Award winners. But first, I'd like to encourage everyone in the audience to leave their comments in the chat box and send kudos to the authors. But if you have a question for an author, please click the Ask a Question button there in Crowdcast. We will share those with the authors offline after the session, and everyone registered for this event at the time of first broadcast will receive an email with written answers later this month. We'd also like to encourage you to click that Buy the Books button down below. By purchasing the author's books, you're supporting the authors themselves, independent book selling, and the Texas Book Festival. The authors will all read for a few minutes, and then we'll get into questions and a discussion. So let's get started. So first up, Ruben de Goyado has been published in Bilingual Review, Reviste Bilingue, Beloit Fiction Journal, Gulf Coast, and Hayden's Ferry Review, and Image. He's an American Short Fiction, Glimmer Train, and Bellingham Review contest finalist. His debut novel, Throw, won the Texas Institute of Letters 2020 Award for Best Young Adult Book and was included on the Texas Library Association's Tasha's List of Best Books for Teen Readers. Throw was also a Christianity Today Book of Merit. His work is forthcoming in anthologies Dreaming of Me, Beyond Borders, and Nepantla Familia. Ruben, it's all yours. All right, thank you. So the section I'm gonna read uh, right now is, my main character is, his name is Cirilo. His friends also call him Güero. It's his nickname and they're doing what kids did in the 90s. I'm assuming they may do that now, but uh, back in the 90s, the big thing to do was go to the mall. Uh, and they're going to La Plaza Mall in McAllen in the Rio Grande Valley to a store called uh, Rave. And it was the uh, kind of like the club where the, the girls would go and buy all the all the fancy clothes for clubs. And he's about to see his ex-girlfriend. Her name is Karina, but her gang name is uh, Yorona. And uh, he's about to uh, run into her. So I'm going to just introduce this character and, and, and just try to think of yourself as you know, that awkward moment when you see an ex, you don't want to see an ex-girlfriend or an ex-boyfriend, but but you see them anyway. So that's, that's what I'm going to read. The question that kept going off in my head like a firecracker was this, where's Yorona? And as if she knew what I was asking, the dressing room door opened and out she walked. Yorona wore a white t-shirt that showed her tight brown stomach with the HCP tattoo. Hispanics causing panic. Her belly button ring and his white pants. She had the blue makeup tears on the inner corners of her black eyes. The only tears she cried now. Yorona's hair was pulled back but with two dagger thin horns of hair, cuernitos pointing to her demonia smile. Her small lips shaded a brown so dark it was almost black. Her naked throat was so long and pretty her collarbone so thin and delicate like a bird's. I remembered holding onto Yorona's neck when I used to walk her to all of her classes, which always made me tardy. At first, she didn't like me to do this because she said it looked like I owned her. What I had said was that I was proud of her, how beautiful she was, but that I could never own her. Yorona would never belong to anyone. How do you own a ghost? But Ray, her current boyfriend, was the one who was proud of her today. And with the way he was looking at me, it all started to make sense. For a second, Yorona gave me this look like she was going to smile and hug and kiss me as if these months of us being apart had never really happened. This was the way it was with us. Because we'd been together since seventh grade off and on for almost four years. Whenever we saw each other, it always took a second to remember we weren't together anymore. We were habits to each other. As soon as we did remember we weren't together anymore, the ghost game began, where we pretended to see right through each other. I never told my friends Angel or Smiley, but I always hoped one of us would stop playing the ghost game. 
that those seconds of forgetting our not going around would go on and on and turn into minutes and hours and longer that our apparitions would take shape, becoming flesh and blood and bone, our hands reaching out to one another to make sure we were real. Yorona smiled and I felt something in my chest, down the back of my neck I had not felt in a long time. But Yorona wasn't looking at me and she sure wasn't smiling for me. She was smiling for Ray. Que gacha. This was what his looks were all about. Ray was looking at her with his player smile, the one that says, I own you. Ray had no idea who Yorona was, the kinds of things she could do to people. Did he think we called her Yorona for nothing? Would she be named for the ghost woman who drowned her babies in the Rio Grande River if she was just some pichona you could control? Some trained little pigeon who would always come back to you? Yorona was no harmless little pigeon. She was the lechuza, the owl you see just before someone is about to die, the one that haunts you in your dreams and you never want to see in real life because it means you're about to lose someone you love. Thank you. Wow. By the way, Ruben, I love Throw. It took me back to my neighborhood and love the dialogue, you know, that, that you had and that sort of ebb and flow of their relationship. Um, that was just excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So next up, poet, teacher, and activist Lupe Mendez is the author of the poetry collection, Why I Am Like Tequila, one of my favorite titles. Um, from Willow Books in 2019, which won the Texas Institute of Letters 2020 Robertson Award for Best First Book of Poetry. His poetry has appeared in Kenyan Review, Poetry Magazine, and Gulf Coast. He has been featured in Houston's Public Media's National Poetry Month series, Voices and Verses, and Poetry House's Showcase Selects series. Lupe earned an MFA in the best creative writing program in Texas at the University of Texas El Paso and lives in Houston where, <laughs> where he has worked as an educator for 20 years. He has recently named, he was recently named festival coordinator for Sin Muros, Houston's first Latinx theater festival for Stages Houston 2020-2021 season. Lupe? Mil gracias. Um, hello, everybody out there. Um, I'll be reading this poem uh, in honor of my mother, uh, who just recently passed. <clears throat> Driving by the Old State Theater on Amaz's 79th birthday. She damn near snaps her neck, eyes stuck to the fachada of an old movie house, bare, gutted, white inside. She smiles looks, says, I know why you are such a bruto mijo, unfolds an old memory. Back in 58, downtown Galveston had signs, big, stark, white, black letter signs, colored here, colored there, nothing but a Mexicanos. Unknown, unless you make a mistake, dangle you in a tree branch late at night. Used to babysit Anita and her pigtails, a nursing school hustle, a barter. Anita had a friend, Ama goes on, beautiful, plump, black, small Olivia. Ama loved to teach the girls how to cook on Saturdays, pancakes, eggs, eat warm syrup with a spoon, buy them dolls, watch them struggle with times tables and takes them to the movie house. In front, it had signs, big, stark, white, black letter signs, no colored here in the building. Mijo, I am a bruta then. Now I love Galveston Island winters, a reason to hide the girls in my peacoat, pay the janitor, sneak them 
through the back door, their hands warm, sticky from sweet maple, their heads, mijo, their heads, unaware of hate, their eyes, their skins are the same in the dark. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Lupe. That was wonderful. And and what a tribute uh, to your mother. So um, finally, Naomi Shehad Nye, a young people's poet laureate for the Poetry Foundation until 2022. She is the editor of the New York Times magazine Poems and on the faculty at Texas State University. Recent books include The Tiny Journalist, a personal favorite of mine, which won the Texas Institute of Letters Smith Award for Best Book of Poetry, Voices in the Air, Poems for Listeners, and Castaway. She is the recipient of two recent Lifetime Achievement Awards from the Texas Institute of Letters, the Lon Tinkle Award, and the National Book Critics Circle, the Ivan Sandroff Award. She lives in San Antonio with her husband and photographer, Michael Nye. Naomi, welcome. Thank you so much, Sergio. And Lupe and Ruben, I am captivated by your beautiful readings. I'll read two poems, one from uh, The Tiny Journalist, which is dedicated to Jenna Jihad Ayad, a young activist in Palestine. She's only 14 years old right now, but she's been a public activist since she was seven years old and started posting videos and commentaries she made with her mother's phone. I urge you all to look her up and uh, never imagine that you know what's going on in Israel if you pay no attention to what is going on for Palestinians. Um, I'm going to read a poem though for all of our ancestors who were immigrants or refugees and my Palestinian father who came to the United States in 1950. Mediterranean Blue. If you are the child of a refugee, you do not sleep easily when they are crossing the sea on small rafts and you know they can't swim. My father couldn't swim either. He swam through sorrow though and made it to the other side on a ship, pitching his old clothes overboard at landing, then tried to be happy, make a new life. But something inside him was always paddling home, clinging to anything that floated, a story, a food, or face. They are the bravest people on earth right now. Don't dare look down on them. Each mind, a universe, swirling as many details as yours, as much love for a humble place. Now the shirt is torn, the sea too wide for comfort, and nowhere to receive a letter for a very long time. And if we can reach out a hand, we better. And I'll read uh, one. So that was from the tiny journalist. And I'll read one poem from Cassaway, which is a book about trash and picking up trash, which ironically came out right at the beginning of the COVID pandemic, after which nobody wanted to touch anything that you would find in a street. So it has had a sort of secret occurrence into the world. But I hope uh, to start my favorite hobby again someday soon, which is cleaning up the hood. And this uh, poem is called Found. I, I wrote a lot stimulated by items uh, actually discovered in the streets. One black button in a small plastic bag. You suit my mood. Where would we begin? to stitch our country back together. Who will make the buttonhole? Z for zipper, but who among us 
could really craft one. A single silver star on a curb by Bonham Elementary. Good work, glimmering like a treasure, stronger at this moment than all 50 drooping on the flagpole. Bravo. Thank you, Naomi. Um, so thank you to all of you. So I want to ask you a few questions and, and please just take turns um, answering them. One of the things that has struck me about reading all of you and, um, and really listening to your interviews and podcasts and on all of that, is that in some ways, I think, uh, I don't know if you also self-describe as literary activists, um, but my question is this, what, what is it that matters to you deeply about um, trying to change this world and why does it matter to you? And how does that work become something that uh, you do through your writing and, and the changes that you wanna see uh, in the world? Um, some of you have already alluded to, to this already, but I'm, I'm interested in how this, because for me, of course, as a writer, it, I'm not just writing for myself, I'm writing to open minds, open hearts, change things. And I wanna hear, you know some of the some of the things that matter to you deeply, and how that becomes part of your work. Um, I could go. Sure. Uh, it's always mattered to me a lot to um, make connections and to uh, pay attention. And so through writing, uh, I try to do that, but also um, to tell the truth, whatever truth it is of wherever you are or what information you're given to experience. Um, I like the quote by the late writer Grace Paley, where she said, politics is simply the way human beings treat one another. And to me, to let other people know how you see the world or how others around you see the world uh, is a, an invitation uh, to be a little more connected to one another and feel part of the same world. Ruben or Lupe? Um, I could go. Um, uh, everything Naomi said had been um, very well said. Um, I keep thinking back to the immediacy and the need for publishing in any regard, right? Um, whether it be self-publishing or a small presses, independent presses, um, or major publication houses, the the need to keep um, both performance and uh, books out in the the open air is the necessity because all of these stories and all of these angles and narratives add to a counter history that as we see today is um, being worked against, right? Um, there are things that, stories that need to be told that haven't been told before um, and voices that need to be shared as many times over. Um, I consider, you know, the work, the activist work in um, framing things in terms of like, how can I provide access for folks to do workshopping? So that they can do it. So, what are ways that you could do that from an educational standpoint? I think those are first and foremost in my mind. Thank you, Lupe. Um, so, on on a lot of different. So, yes, amen, amen, and and <laughs> everything you all said. Um, so. Uh, on a on on a personal level, uh, with my with my work anyway, I can just speak to what I do. Is um, I, I want I want people to know that we're that our like our Chicano people, our Latinx, Latino, how whatever you want to call you know, um, is that we are we are not a monolithic people, and so I think there's this tendency that um, in 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 a lot of work is that we expect. Uh, a lot of readers expect 
you know the the immigrant story they expect the the uh the hardship and the, and the trauma of a, a lot of the folks that are you know have immigrated to the united states um and that's a very important and valid story to be told and we need that story but we have other stories um and so i, I guess in my work I'm, I'm second generation on one side i'm third generation on the other i'm telling uh post-immigrant stories i'm, I'm telling the effects of immigration, uh, second, third generation down the line, you know, what what we carry and what we leave behind uh, is very important to me in my work. And then and then the other side is the spiritual side. I'm a person of faith. Um, and in my story, I, I want uh, to tell redemptive stories. I want I want re reconciliation in my stories. And so the example is is in my book is, is this character of Yorona, who's adopted this name and, and she's uh, by all accounts, if you read the the the, the story of La Llorona, she's she's beyond redemption. Um, but I wanted to take a different tack and say, you know what? I don't think she is. I think I think she's you know, she's capable of being redeemed. And this that's the kind of story I wanted to tell here. Thank you. So well, well, the other thing that struck me about reading and and really uh, diving into your work, and that I, I think you all share this connection in different ways. Is, is that I think the voices and perspectives of young people affect you and inspire you. And like for Naomi, the, the tiny journalist that literally is the, the voice of that book and, and, and the focus and, and Lupe, your, your job as an educator and, and reaching you know, young people. Uh, and Ruben, of course, you're writing for young adults. And wh why is it that young people inspire you? Do they inspire you because you know, we don't want to be cerrados, closed-minded anymore. We want to see the world through their eyes. Is it, um, do you want to reach them and save them, save your own young self that you see in them? You know, what, what, what inspires you about young people? Everything. <laughs> um, I, you know, I've always thought of poetry was the magic language and children were the magical people. They were closest to the ground, closest to honesty, closest to detail. And um, I spend a lot of time right now with our four-year-old grandson. And uh, when I'm with him, I just feel as if language itself is a sacred space. And I'm constantly writing down little things he says as I did with his father, our son. But even when he asks me a question, his... Um, his care in the question today, he looked at a picture of kids in Gaza that's on my desk. And he said to me, who are these children? Who are these kids and what are they eating? And I thought that is such a grassroots kind of question. Who are they? What are they eating? Not like what is the political nightmare that has created the fact that they live in the world's largest open air prison, but what are they eating? Um, I just feel staying close. I love how you said it, Sergio, to the child inside each one of us is very important for keeping our writerly um, awareness, our aptitude for the world, our alert self um, in gear, awake, you know, staying awake. So um, they've always been the most important people in the world to me. And I also have worked with them my entire adult life and uh, feel very privileged to spend time with young people. Thank you, Naomi. Um, I, like a part of it is, I so demographically, I've, I've spent a larger chunk of my time as an educator working with black and brown students who reflected the places that I grew up in kind of, right? But at the same time, um, helping them try to navigate a world that, that, to be honest, had, there were obstacles, right? And so what can I do to be a voice that I didn't have when I was doing things right as the son of an undocumented father and a southern tejana the 
My father has a second grade uh, education in his own native Spanish, um, never learned English. Um, and my mother got as far as getting her licensing for nursing, Kevin Paz Descanse, um, but she never attained a, an associate's. And so the, the, you know, me stepping forward, graduating high school was a thing, going to college was a thing, uh, realizing that I'm the, when I got my MA creative writing, my MFA in creative writing, I wasn't just selfishly getting an MFA for writing. I ended up getting a master's and I was like, oh, wait, the family, like that's a whole nother. And so being able to like share that experience with the kids and being able to say, look, you can do these things. Some of you are in the very same situations that I found myself in. Like the idea of what an immigrant family is doesn't change, even through all the, the political upheaval all the things that exist in an immigrant family are there. And so why not find ways to provide both in written work and then as guideposts, uh, the things that might help ease the tensions and the days that, that they run into because it's always going to be full of them. Um, and so I take that as like a call to action moving forward. Awesome. Thank you, Lupe. Um, so I think about myself, you know, you, you mentioned, you know, am I trying to save my former self? I don't know how you worded it. You said it better than that. But um, so I think about the fact that when, when I was in high school, um, I was a voracious reader. I read a lot, but it wasn't cool to read. So I kind of just kept it on the down low. You know, I go to the library, uh, you know, on the off times, not with my friends. Um but I read a lot, and but what was crazy was that it wasn't until I got to college that I actually read anything that had people that looked like me, because um, you know, and 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 the first book was was uh, I want to say it was um, it was Sandra Cisneros, and and I think it was uh, Woman Hollering Creek, and that was the first time I read brown people. I heard Spanish, um, but like I said, I had read before uh, a lot. So my goal in writing this book was um, for all the brown kids, because I am an I'm a educator myself. I was a teacher, assistant principal, a principal, um, and so I saw a lot of the kids hungry for books that had kids like them in the books. And so uh, when I set out to write the book, that's what I wanted to do. Is I wanted to write characters that sounded like you know, kids that I taught sounded like, you know, friends I had, you know, some of the things I said, uh, the stories that I knew grow growing up, I wanted to infuse all of that. So that another I, I don't want another kid to ever wait until they get to college to read a book that has someone in the book that looks like them sounds like them, and, and, and has a has a shared history with that character. I don't want another student to have that experience in this country, basically. Thank you. Wow. Great answers. I'm glad we're recording this, <laughs> by the way. Uh, I can listen to it and learn a little bit every time. Um, I'm going to ask you this question that I think is asked a lot at panels like these at the Texas Book Festival. But I, I'm always curious what the answer is, because it's, it's always a little bit different. What does it mean for you to be a Texas writer? And like, how do the geographies or peoples or cultures or issues in this state influence your writing? And do you ever, by the way, chafe against what Texas might mean to you or to others? So it, it's not just, I love this, it's also, I'm fighting to change this. And, you know, what, what, what does it mean to you to be a Texas writer? I chafe against what other people think about Texas but I feel very proud to be a Texas writer and not having been born here, having come here as a teenager and then going to college in Texas and staying in the city where I went to college, um, for me has been most instructive and welcoming into uh, a spacious world that I, and not only spacious by way of the land of Texas, but all of the many cultures that have mingled. I live just a few blocks from the Institute of Texan Cultures and um, all of the many backgrounds that have mingled to make this state 
uh, the rich tapestry of peoples that it is. But I really love Texas, the, the positive um, spirit of Texas. And uh, you're right, it's not, not a political thing, um, certainly not, but it's, it's just a spirit thing. You know, it's a, a, a sensibility. Um, in my earliest years working for the Texas Commission on the Arts, I had a, an opportunity to live in small towns all over Texas for different amounts of time, like two weeks, five weeks, a month. And I often stayed on, on farms or ranches or in homes with people. So I had a chance to really find out about the backgrounds of so many corners of Texas. And um, to me, to be from a state that is so full of, of diversity is a great privilege and honor. I love it. I like being on the border with Mexico. I wish we had a better relationship at the moment with that border. And it always felt that we were so lucky to be in a place, um, well, like San Antonio, for example, where, um, where Latinx culture was the dominant culture. Um, yet someone else like myself could be welcomed here. And uh, so I'm very proud when I'm identified as a Texas writer. And I also feel that no matter how long you live here, you keep finding out more about Texas. I don't have any delusion that I know enough. That's why I love the Texas Book Festival, because you're always encountering new voices, new stories, new backgrounds. Sorry to talk too much. <laughs> You're not. I could I could listen to you all night long. Thank you. Oh, you're so sweet. Thank Same. <laughs> um, so similarly to Naomi, um, I chafe at other people when they try to label Texas writers. Like, I don't know. I, I, and I have very dear, close, almost like familia, like friends that are like, uh, so how's everything in Texas? And I, my response is, I don't know, because it's a big state. Houston's great. Galveston's really good. Like, you know, El Campo's all right. Like, I, you know, but it's like, you, you, I can't, you can't rep all the different, because it's, what, 13 hours just to get to El Paso from Houston? Like, whatever. Um, but so conceptually, um, I am also proud of how being a, a, a writer in quote unquote the Lone Star State um, reminds me so much of both my parents. It's this weird, like my, my traditionally when you think of like uh, immigrants from Mexico, they, they cluster, right? Like community tells you, I trabajo in, you know, this space, so go get a job there, right? So like most of, most of the immigrants um, from parts of Mexico that come to Texas are from northern states in Mexico. And the fact that my father bucked tradition uh, from the state of Jalisco, um, most Jaliscienses go to California or Illinois. And the fact that my dad was like, nah, I'm going to Texas. And that was really interesting. It's almost like growing up in a smaller community within the community kind of a deal. And then also my mother, like nobody from, you know, the Rio Grande Valley, um, had migrated to Galveston. And so growing up as a kid along the coast um, allows me to reflect like, you know, what are the poetic and literary voices from my own hometown? And I think that's the treasure of being a Texas writer, that we can be from all these different landscapes, right? Like there is a Gulf Coast, there are canyons, there are all these different, um, hill country everything about it and not one way of writing about it represents all of the state right and so i think it's i find it that it's like this little quiet secret that we get to hold on to that people might not be aware of until they decide to start exploring uh the literary landscape that, that, that the state provides thank you lupe so i i'm a uh I wasn't born here in Texas. I'm going to tell you that right now. But my my sangre, my familia, they've been here for generations uh, in in the valley. I, I've lived in Oregon, uh, Florida, and in, in, in uh, Indiana. I was born where I was born. But 
when I was in when I was in Oregon, I was living in the Portland area, and they people would ask me, you know, the question, the dreaded question, "Where are you from?" Like, so they're trying to they're, they're trying to gauge your I don't know your ethnicity. Like, what box can I put you in? Right. So I would say, "I'm from Texas," and they would say, "Well, what part?" I said, "Well, South Texas," and then they would say, "San Antonio, San Antonio," and, and I'd say, "No, no, not San Antonio." And then they would kind of go through their mental map, uh, Corpus Christi, no, keep going. So when I, when I think about Texas and, 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 I, and I was writing, you know, um, James Joyce wrote uh, Dubliners um, when he was, I think he was living in Prague or something like that. He, he, wasn't in, he wasn't in Dublin at the time, but he wrote this collection of short stories about Dublin and he, he fully realized it. Um, and so the majority of my stories that I wrote um, about Texas, I was actually in Oregon when I wrote them. And so that was my connection to Texas, to, to the Rio Grande Valley. And, and so I would get, you know, very, my, my hackles up, I would get offended. Well, South Texas, I, you know, I live, I'm from the Rio Grande Valley and there's McAllen, there's Brownsville, there's Edinburgh, there's all these places um, along the border. And, 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 the place where we're from, where I'm from, and, and Lupe, you were, you know, you were born here in San Benito, I believe, um, is that we're, we're in a liminal space where we live. Uh, a lot of people and in Texas don't even know this, but for me to go north to Austin, San Antonio, um, even Corpus, I have to go through a checkpoint. So anytime I wanna travel north anywhere, I have to prove who I am. So that's why I believe like my identity is very set uh, as being a Texan because I have to prove it all the time. You know what I mean? I have to say, yes, sir, I'm an American citizen. I mean, I could fight it, but if I want to get to where I'm going, I just have to answer the question. So what I guess what I want people to know about Texas is just like what I mentioned earlier about, about, about Chicanos and, and Latinos, Latinx, is that we're not a, we're not a monolithic people and we're not a monolithic state, is that Houston has its own vibe. San Antonio has its own vibe. The Rio Grande Valley and the border from, from Brownsville and all the way to El Paso, uh, Sergio, where you're from, and Isleta and those areas out there, is that we, we're, we have our own unique subset of culture and we have wonderful stories to tell from all of those areas. So the, the best thing I think I just found out is of all four of us, I'm the only one who was born in Texas. <laughs> and I'm in Connecticut right now, but let me just tell you, outside my house, I fly the Texas flag. <laughs> Do it. What? Good Texas stuff. Good stuff. What, was it, was <laughs> it Lupe? Lupe, weren't you born in Texas? I was, I was born in Galveston. So I, oh, I you were born in Galveston. Like, I thought you were in Jalisco. In Galveston, from Jalisco. But, no. but so, yeah, but so like, like growing up in, in Galveston, like people are like, oh, you're from Austin or San Antonio or Corpus, like really brown spaces. And I'm like, no, I'm from a really white space in Galveston. Like, where's that? And I'm like, it's where there's a 1900 storm. We're famous for lots of destruction. Yeah. And oh, that's kind of a sad thing. But like conceptually, like all that in and out, like what is that movement, right? And so right. that lends to one's own identity. To So here's the last question I have for you, and then we'll wrap it up. And it's just quickly. Uh, because what we're doing right here, right now, is because of COVID-19. And I want to know how it's affected your writing life and your work life. And what do you think of something that will permanently change in your society or culture or, or in your ambit of, of, of work, even after a vaccine is available? Because one of the things, of course, that happened in 1918 after the pandemic is there were se several things that changed dramatically uh, for decades after that pandemic. And I think the same thing will happen now. And I'm just curious, you know, what you think, uh, how it's affected you and also what do you think will change permanently if you could speculate a little bit about your own life? So... I'll be, I'm going to end up cussing when I say this, but, um, I'm not, I'm not going to bullshit. I finally have an office. Like I've never, we had, we have like our library where we have all our books. Uh, my wife and I are both writers. And so we have one room that has all our books and 
you and our kids books are in there. And but we she was working from home for a while, and so we got her a desk and a chair and the whole thing. She was working from home and used it out of the office space. But the minute you know we were in this for the long haul, we converted our back bedroom into a full on office for the both of us. I bought a desk and have a chair and a double screen and I have an office space to write and do. And I used to sit on the couch to to do the creative work, but now I actually have like almost like a grown up writer space kind of deal. And it feels like I'm adjusting to it and I like it and I want to keep it because I, I itched for the longest time. I was like, I want my own la 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 when i got it like forced you know i will to, to do it so yeah i'll go um you know i think for for a lot of writers they, they there there hasn't been a real in between they were either either more creative or they were unable to write that that's just what i've seen from the friends i've talked to um for me, how it impacted me was it gave me a sense of urgency. Um, I have, you know, a couple of different manuscripts working through them. And, and there's always this concern that I'm going to get sick. I'm going to catch COVID and then I'm going to be down and out for, you know, a month or two months. So I'm like, I need to get this project done in case that happens. So it gave me a sense of urgency. It also... I am working from home as well. Um, I, I do have a home office, just like like Lupe, and 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 I think what what I've done now is um, with the normal commute that I had an hour in the morning, an hour uh, in the afternoon, in the evening, I've I've sat down. So like when I'm done from work, I I put away my work computer and I get out my my Mac, my MacBook where my stories are at. So I just keep that flow going. Um, so it's been very good for me. So, you know, in that seven, seven, eight o'clock time in the morning, uh, I do writing and then I, I write in the afternoon. And as far as the thing that, that I hope or what I see changing, well, I can tell you what I hope changes. Um, and it's it sounds like a small thing, but I think it's I think it's a big deal in the long run is, is I, I really do hope that in work culture, whether that be academia, whether that be uh, in the education realm, in in uh, you know, in the business world, I, I, I hope that we um, stop celebrating people working while they're sick. Um, I, because I think there's always this, you know, hey, look at him. He's, he's working hard. You know, he's, he's pulling through. I, I, I've never been okay with that kind of toxic workplace culture. So I, I hope that, you know, when somebody is ill or they need to, time to rest and, and heal up, I think uh, I would like to see that, you know, that changes and we give people the space and the time that they need. Thank you. That's really beautiful. And um, and I'm so glad you have a desk, Lupe. You deserve it. Um, yeah, I think that writers are, we're so well suited to seclusion in some way that uh, the solitary time we've had uh, feeling more isolated has probably been less strange for us than for many others because we spend a lot of time with reading and writing and communicating through our computers or still writing letters through the mail or whatever. So that part felt intensified for the past six months, but um, not really uh, altered. But today, just since you asked that question, Sergio, I went for the first time with a 93-year-old, my mother, and a four-year-old, my grandson, to an outdoor restaurant in a garden. She was so desperate to be out in society again. Uh, she's just tired of seeing her four walls. And um, I have to say, I was anxious through the entire meal. And even though people were distanced and wearing masks, and even the men at the next table were wearing gloves while they ate, which wow. seemed odd, um, being there with, with two people I love very much, but I feel kind of responsible for uh, their vulnerability also. So I felt an anxiety that I'm just not used to feeling in social experience. So I wonder, will there come a day when you just casually go and sit with a bunch of people you don't know in a restaurant again and everything feels the same? I don't know. Um, and 
I did notice I would like to end with this remark because it's more positive that the servers in this restaurant at the San Antonio Botanic Garden were possibly the kindest servers I have ever encountered. They were all masked. And so it felt um, odd to be served by masked people, but they were so tender with us as if they were so grateful that we had come out and were trusting to sit in a restaurant again. And that made me think about just the poignancy of human kindness. Um, we've all missed our friends, but we've also just missed contact with strangers. And that has taken on a different, um, a different tone. So I hope we get back to the casual contact with strangers, but also I feel very grateful for the tenderness we feel now to take care of one another. Wow, excellent. So thank you, uh, Ruben, Lupe, and Naomi for a wonderful panel and discussion. I also wanna thank everyone who came to our Texas Institute of Letters award winners panel. Uh, remember to click the buy books button in Crowdcast to enjoy the great work of these writers. It's the best way to support their work and to keep independent bookstores thriving. I'd like to thank the Texas Book Festival, their staff, and in particular, Matt Patton for all their hard work and organization to encourage reading and literacy and for the grants to support Texas public libraries. Public libraries are at the heart of our democracy. They are where the people, la gente, go to educate themselves and learn. So let's all join in this mission with the Texas Book Festival to support them. Thank you. <laughs>